all of you most of you namaste i welcome all of you to other uh, 12th platinum dubi lecture of jay <laughs> university i am manjari bakhi faculty of economics and deputy registrar of the jay university uh, we are in the amrita vihar campus of the jay university esteemed vice chancellor professor atul kumar pati sai chairing this particular lecture and to my extreme left we have dr hemo kumar nai the controller of examination of the jm university a uh, dear friends uh, we are fortunate to have got a top notch academician of india a thinker uh, dr ashok bora sir he is from a former professor and head of philosophy delhi university sir is currently active in his teaching and research work so thank you sir i welcome you to the 12th lecture of the platinum dubi lecture series thank you for accepting the invitation of our honorable vice chancellor thank you sir <laughs> now i welcome all of you almost 160 participants have joined this platform we are having a second platform we are live streaming the whole session whole lecture so more than uh, 4 500 participants are watching this particular program right now i welcome all of you to this our uh, lecture now for those who have joined us today for the first time let me tell you the gm college it started in 1944 as the sambalpur college then in 1949 it was renamed as the gangadhar meher college in 1991 the gangadhar meher college was accorded with the autonomy status by the ugc then because of its performance because of the human resources that, it, that this institution has created over the years in 2015 may 30th the government of odisha upgraded the gangadhar meher autonomous college to the gangadhar meher university so currently the gangadhar meher university is working as a unit university and as a university we have completed five years recently but but as an institution we completed 75 years in 2019 july 7 is precisely the start the foundation day of the institution so on july 7 2019 this institution as a whole as a college then as a university as a university completed 75 years just one year before that that means on 7th july 2018 under the ecu leadership of our honorable vice chancellor professor atul kumar pati the gm university started celebrating the platinum jubilee year we started a one year celebration but mostly in an academic manner now in the academic manner means our vice chancellor announced in a very fast launching session in the launching meeting that the gmu is, is going to have 12 lectures under the banner of the platinum jubilee lecture series now our plan was to complete 12 lectures over a period of one year so that it culminates on the 75th year itself on the day of the constitution of 75th year but due to some unavoidable circumstances we could complete only nine lectures in the physical mode and now in the, 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 the last three lectures including this one we are conducting in a virtual mode and the results are known to you all today is the last lecture of the series is the 12th lecture of the series and we are fortunate enough that we have got a great academician a thinker uh professor asok bohra sir to keep it keep the keep the third lecture the final lecture of this particular series so i welcome all of you to the third lecture and we are indebted to you all for joining our virtual platform today thank you all and namaskar now we will move with the proceeding as per the agenda uh, now please the stand up for the university anthem to start uh, before that let me introduce you our uh, two more of uh, uh, professors from the department of philosophy uh, because it is a university sponsored program platinum jubilee lecture series but uh, our school of philosophy they are cooperating us in organizing this particular lecture uh, so we have with us uh, dr mohin mohammad a uh, professor and head of the school of philosophy uh, sir is going to uh, going to give the welcome address uh, then we have dr ashok kumar tarai assistant professor of philosophy a young dynamic uh, uh, professor 
uh, he is also a part of this particular meeting. Uh, so I welcome uh, Dr. Mohin Mahmud sir and also uh, uh, Dr. Tarai also Kumar Tarai. So now please stand up for the university and then to start. I request Asis Kumar Patel system manager to please coordinate. Chancellor, sir, esteemed speaker, Vinas, Professor Asok Gora, sir, Honorable Registers, Sri Girish Chandra Singh, and Deputy Register, Dr. Uma Charan Pati, distinguished colleagues, and this is the uh, you know, Gangadhar Meher University has been conducting the platinum, a series of platinum jubilee webinar. And this is the 12th well, the series. At the outset, I extend a very hearty welcome to all of you to this last 12th webinar uh, entitled Happiness, Satisfaction and Contentment. As you know, happiness is the prime objective of each and every human being across the globe. It is an experience, joy, positive well-being, combining with a sense of one's life, a sense of one's life is good, meaningful, demands of our need doesn't necessarily mean that we are happy. We saw that happiness and satisfaction are not similar. In fact, the difference between them lies in the fact that happiness is loved with others while satisfaction is enjoyed within. Despite the different, moreover, happiness is popularly understood as being content what we have in our life, which in fact comes down to two different kinds of satisfaction, that is material satisfaction 
or what we call uh, the hedonistic satisfaction and the spiritual satisfaction that is uh, that may be called the uh, eudomonistic satisfaction it seems one can truly attain happiness by striking a balance between those two sources of satisfaction and this is this balance exactly what contentment is all about this contentment can be ensured by appreciating what we have in our life and not uh, desiring all that we want and this has been endorsed by and this has been bowsed by principal of the human wants as we study in economics that all the wants are satisfiable uh, all the wants cannot be satisfied but a particular mm. want can be satisfiable mm. but if we have a strong sense of contentment it doesn't matter whether we obtain the object of our desire or we don't either way we are content we are still content in fact contentment and happiness are just like two connected doors if you knock at one the other will open automatically now as the world continues to battle with the corona virus pandemic severely impacting our general well being the worst victim may be our happiness we are mostly feeling isolated depressed and subdued however life as you know is a journey not a destination now we have to move on and strive to find happiness even in this unprecedented adversity this is the reason why this webinar bear a huge significance today we have with us professor ashok bora our teacher a shyam of sense of the concepts of happiness satisfaction and contentment vishabis what is happening around in this prime in this time pandemic situation once again i heartily extend a very cordial welcome to all the participants now now it is time professor dr ashok kumar tarai assistant professor school of philosophy to introduce our guest dr tarai vice chancellor professor ashok kumar tarai respected registrar sri girish chandra singh respected deputy registrar dr umar charan pati respected city council chairperson professor mahapatra respected controller of examination dr naik respected head professor mohini mohammad and other distinguished faculty colleagues and not only the faculty members of this university i'm sure most of the faculty members those who are working outside this university have also joined this lecture i can see professor mahi the former head of revenza university faculty members from uttar university and different various colleges have also joined it is my both privilege and pleasure to introduce professor bora but before i do that our honorable vice chancellor professor atul kumar pati professor pati has done his higher education from banaras hindu university he completed his phd in the year 1982 in the subject zoology specialized in chronobiology and thereafter he has been teaching at pandit ravi shankar shukla university since 1983 he is a noted scientist of chronobiology not only in india but across the world professor pati has more than 200 publications 
published by various international and national publishing houses. Also part of various members of the academic and non-academic committees across the country. And he has been serving as a vice chancellor from July 2017 till present. Within the very few months of experience at GMU, I must say, our vice chancellor sir is not only a dynamic administrator and academic, but also a very charming personality. I think that really helps one to orient or engage with the university administration with a very positive way. You are a source of inspiration for all of you, all of us, sir. Now, today's guest, Professor Bora, absolutely doesn't need an introduction. He is a stalwart, not only in India, but also across the globe. Absolutely. Bora uh, has done his BAC from Punjab University in the year 1968. And then he did his MA and PhD from University of Delhi. And he completed his PhD in the year 1976. And he joined as a lecturer in Stephen's College in 1975, which is one of the added, one of the allied colleges of University of Delhi. And in 1988, he joined University of Delhi as a reader and he retired as a professor until recently, I think in 2014, as a professor. Now he is teaching philosophy at OP Jindal Global University, Haryana, as a professor. Professor Bora is specialized in analytic philosophy, philosophy of Uttenstein, contemporary Indian philosophy, and philosophy of religion. Professor Bora is not only an outstanding teacher, but also a various researcher in the subject philosophy. He has published more than 100 research articles in various international and national journals. He has authored more than 10 books, such as Wittgenstein's Philosophy of Mind, which is the first book that he published in 1986, and which was again reissued by Rockledge in the year 2014. And for this book, he was awarded Swami Pranavananda Philosophy Prize in the year 1987 by Indian Philosophical Congress. He has also co-authored a book called Radha Krishna, Its Life and Ideas, which Professor K. Sachitananda Murthy, which was published by State University of New York Press, 1992. He has also co-edited a book called The Philosopher of Kesar, Sachitananda Murthy, which Professor Sivjivan Bharacharya, which was published by Indian Council of Philosophical Research in the year 1995. And he has also co-edited another book, that is Dharma, the Categorical Imperative, with the great professors, uh, Professor Minal Mori and Professor Abhin Sarma. And the other book recently he has published is Mind, Morals and Self, a philosophical perspective, which was published by Viva Books, New Delhi, in 2014. Now, apart from these books, uh, he has also translated various books of Ludwig Wittgenstein into Hindi. And those who know, know little about Wittgenstein's philosophy, let me briefly talk about him. Uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein is an Austrian philosopher who first published a book called Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. The English name of the book is called Treatise of Logical Philosophy, which was published in Germany in 1921 and in English in 1922. Now, he thought that he had solved all the philosophical problems by publishing this book. And then he left philosophy literally. He started teaching elementary students somewhere in Norway and thought that philosophy, you know, doesn't need him or he doesn't need philosophy since he has solved all the philosophical problems. But later on in 1930s, he came to realize that it is not so. He is perhaps hugely mistaken. 
and therefore he went to join Cambridge University once again in 1939. And then he was heavily engaged in writing a book called Philosophical Investigations, which was posthumously published after 1950, 1955. Now, as you see, he has only published one book and other works were published posthumously. Now that shows how original philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein is. And why I get this brief idea about Ludwig Wittgenstein, it is primarily because that this is, this is something very official, that he has been considered or debated or, and interpreted as the most original and significant philosopher of the whole 20th century until today. And 21st century has not ended. So I would say till today. Now, Professor Bora has tried to translate his original works into Hindi. By doing that, he has introduced Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein's philosophy to Indian students or to uh, those who follow Hindi uh, to them. And for that, he has been also awarded a prize by Indian Council of Philosophical Research and particularly for his translation called Philosophical Investigations. And he has translated uh, Culture and Value, Uncertainty, and Tractatus Logic of Philosophers. He has also participated in many international and national conferences and seminars. He has been to many countries to present his philosophical views, such as United States of America, United Kingdom, Austria, Japan, Thailand, Kenya, North Korea, South Korea, Lithuania, Greece, Czechoslovakia, and Canada. Besides all these philosophical works, which are analytic in nature, he has also been engaged with the existential problems of humanity and the moral problems of human life. And this is reflected through his public, popular writings in the newspapers. He writes for various newspapers, such as Times of India, Hindustan Times, The Tribune, The Pioneer, etc. He has authored more than hundreds of articles. And I want to uh, say one thing here, and this is a purely personal observation about Professor Boga, that I see there are two kinds of philosophers uh, all over the world. One who does philosophy in a very hardcore sense or by employing uh, the analytic methodology, so therefore it becomes altogether an analytic exercise for doing the so-called hardcore philosophy. And the other group that does philosophy and that touches upon the problems of human life, the existential problems of human life and so on. So that is the practical understanding of philosophy and these days we call it experimental philosophy. So you basically find these two kinds of philosophers. Now Professor Bora is it's one such unique philosopher who does in both ways. He does hardcore philosophy, which is very analytic in nature, and he tries to apply that in understanding the problems of philosophy. I think that makes him a great philosopher, not only in India, but also across the world. Now, as far as the administrative responsibilities are concerned, Professor Bora has been the head Department of Philosophy, University of Delhi, for several times, Dean, Arts and Humanities, and a member of various academic committees across the country. He has served as a member secretary, but is a very prestigious and honorary post of Indian Council of Philosophical Research. And those who do not know about Indian Council of Philosophy, Philosophical Research, this is an autonomous body sponsored by the Government of India to encourage philosophical thinking and he has been uh, he has served as a member secretary for that institution from 2019 to 2012. He is also in the editorial board of different national and international journals such as Humanitas, 
Asiatic and International Biannual Journal in Philosophy, published from Seoul National University of Korea, Religious Thought, published by Al Mustafa International University, Iran, Dilatato Kode, Journal of Dialogue of Religious Experience, a multilingual international journal published from Rome, Italy. Besides all these international affiliation, he has been also associated with many journals in India, such as Unmila, Indian Journal of Analytic Philosophy, which is published by Utkal University, Ravensa Journal of Philosophy, which is published by Ravensa University, Department of Philosophy, and Indian Philosophical Quarterly, which is published by Pune University, and other such journals, such as uh, Unmilan, Pratistan, Suvidha, and so on. Now, before I uh, stop my speech or introduction of Professor Bora, uh, I must pay my obligation to Professor Bora primarily for two reasons, and I have been searching for an opportunity to do that, and I haven't found one. And today, I think I should use this opportunity to pay my obligation to Professor Bora, essentially for two reasons. One, for his book, The Odenstein's Philosophy of Mind, which was published in 1986, as I told you earlier. Now, this is a very original book, that which I used for my PhD. And I did a PhD on Stein's philosophy. So I used it uh, for my PhD. Uh, and the other article, that is the pulling of the ladder, metaphysical roots of Wittgenstein's practice, logic of philosophical, which was published in 1995 journal, by Journal of the Indian Council of Philosophical Research. And this article encouraged me to write my PhD thesis primarily because he also sought for some kind of metaphysical uh, thesis that is available in Einstein philosophy. And my, my job in PhD was like that. I also argued that Wittgenstein, in some sense, talking about metaphysics, though there are debates and interpretations, most of the people would, would not agree to that. But that is the beauty of philosophy. You agree and disagree on a particular issue. So that is one thing, one reason that I'm extremely uh, obliged to Professor Bora. The other thing is, uh, it goes back to his visit to Sri Mata Vaishnavdev University in the year 2013 or 14. Uh, he was a resource person for an academic event. And he recommended two of the books that I will never ever forget in my life. And one is The Difficulty of Being, which is written by Guru Charan das, Dr. Guru Charan das. Now, this is a book which deals with the moral dilemma of human life. And he has touched upon, I mean, Guru Charan das has touched upon both the Western ethical principles, such as the Bausch principle, the utilitarian principle, and the deontological principle. And interestingly, the Indian ethics right, that comes from the Bhagavad Gita, what we call the Nishkama Karma, which has some close affiliation affiliation with the deontological principle of Kant. Now, <clears throat> this is a must read for all the philosophy students, I should say. And the other book, which also sort of introduces the whole idea of Western philosophy, uh, that is written by Justin Gardner, and that book's name is Sophie's World, a novel on history of philosophy. This is not a philosophical work per se, but it is essentially novel to so someone's voice. How do you make sense of Western philosophy? I think for this recommendation, I am extremely obliged once again to Professor Bora. And before I end, just one request to all our dear students, those who are attending this lecture, and my esteemed faculty colleagues, please keep a pen and notepad ready with you note down the important points of his lecture. I'm sure he is going to give you a new perspective, a new understanding of philosophy that you have, if at all, you have understood philosophy earlier. But he is going to introduce you 
philosophy adopted on the particular issue about happiness, contentment, and satisfaction. Uh, thank you once again. Thank you, Dr. Poppy, for giving me this opportunity to introduce Professor Bora. It was, it was, it was a pleasure and privilege. Uh, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Tarai. In the last three years' time, he has taken the institution to a very high level. If we talk about academics, talk about infrastructure development, introduction of MP and PhD programs in all major departments. He is very transparent in chairman. He conducted recruitment of teaching and non-teaching staff. Plagiarism policy, a lot of things is a long list. I am not going to read out the list because this is not the occasion. So, Professor Pati has made us proud in multiple dimensions. And this is the 12th lecture of the Pratham Jubilee Lecture Series in the last one and a half years' time. This is a testimony to the fact that how academically vibrant he has built this university. Now, I request Professor Pati sir to speak few words. To the audience and everyone associated with this program, sir. Samastam to Namaskar. I spoke in Nodia. That means that good morning, all of you. And this is a very auspicious day. And we have our revered professor, uh, Professor Bora from University of Delhi. And he is, uh, you know, you have already listened to it, the introduction. By Dr. Tarai. And uh, Professor Bora, uh, this is uh, for you. This is for you. This is the bouquet. Uh, this is I'm doing in Dr. William. Thank you very much. So, uh, Dr. Bora, you'll be happy that uh, in the audience we have nearly 300 plus people, and I welcome all of them to this lecture. And this is a wonderful day for us. And you know that, sir, you know my background, I am a biologist and the field biologist and uh, happiness you know i only know the biochemistry of happiness <laughs> so there are four molecules which are involved in the happiness one is the endorphin the endorphin is which you know cut the pain signals whatever pain signals are coming this molecule you know that breaks that signal and then we have another molecule that is known as dopamine and dopamine, you know, that is a neurotransmitter and is secreted from the brain and uh, nerve endings, and it is a reward molecule. I mean, uh, uh, whenever there is something you do, you get a reward, and that gives happiness. And then we have another molecule that is oxytocin, that is you know, a social chemical, that is you know, the social bonding, uh, the love between individuals between pairs of individuals in a group and that is a you know pro-social molecule and uh, there is another that is known as serotonin and this is a confidence building molecule that means you feel very confident when this molecule is more in your blood state so these are the principally four molecules that is behind the happiness that we experience but there are others as well that is one is GABA and that is anti-anxiety molecule that means that that saves from saves you from anxiety and there is adrenaline that is an energy molecule that means if there is no energy in your body you cannot feel happy yourself so therefore all these molecules I know but I don't want to be a barrier between the audience and the professor Bora so I just uh, 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 on behalf of Gangadhar Mayor University, once again, I am obliged to you, sir, Professor Bora. We are all grateful to you. And uh, now the platform is yours. And please uh, have it with pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, now we will we, uh, listen to our chief speaker. But before that, uh, uh, let me inform the August audience uh, that last year our number vice chancellor announced that the GMU is going to be the first university, at least in the state of Odisha, to offer a course on happiness. And we are on it. We are taking the help of our head of the Department of Philosophy. The start program may be at a very elementary level this year. Uh, second thing that I want to tell you about is that, uh, if, if you could go by the title of the topic that uh, Professor Boras has selected, that is 
satisfaction, happiness, and contentment. Sir was talking about the science part of it. Now, being a student of economics, we are talking about gross happiness index. Then there are people in sociology. Then it is associated with psychology. Philosophy is in a major way dealing with these subjects. So it is purely a multidimensional aspect. But as a layman, from the standpoint of philosophy, now one question was coming to my mind yesterday night. Now, whether we start from the first part, we move from first satisfaction, then happiness, finally contentment, or first comes contentment, then you become happy, then you feel satisfied. I don't know whether we start from the left or the right. That is one part. Second thing, uh, I just take two minutes to tell you. Now I just just uh, I bought a uh, quotation, sloka, Sanskrit sloka from the Kora.com. Now it says like this: Santosha Paramo Lava, Satsanga Parama Gatihi. Professor Vora is going to uh, tell you about the details. Vichara uh, Paramo Gyanam, Shomohi Paramo Sukham. Now it says, contentment is the highest gain, good company, the highest force, enquiry, the highest wisdom, and peace, the highest enjoyment. I am quoting from the Torah.com. Second part, now we will go to the Buddha's text, Buddhism. Now what Gautam Buddha has said, two just two liners I am picking up before we go to listen to the Torah. Now Buddha said, judge nothing, you will be happy. Forgive everything, you will be happier. Love everything, you will be happiest. Now these are some of the other inputs. And finally, what Buddha says, there is no path to happiness. I repeat, there is no path to happiness. Happiness is the path. Now with this, I request Professor Bora sir, sir please start your address sir, uh, more than 200, 300 people have joined the two platforms, so we are thankful to everyone, please listen to the great academician and the thinker, uh, and to utilize the time for us, thank you sir, thank you, please sir. Visionary and dedicated uh, Vice Chancellor, Atanuk Marpati, Mohin, Mohin Muhammad. Dr. Tarai, Dr. Naik, Registrar and Deputy Registrar. I'm grateful for to all of you for the welcome that you've given to me. And uh, I'm also grateful for the for the pre-discussion that is going on on happiness. I'm happy that happiness has become a top a theme with all of you. And before I begin, I must thank uh, Dr. Tarai for all the kind words and the elaborate introduction that he gave. I don't think whether I deserve it or not, but uh, I hope I shall be able to fulfill uh, some of the expectations from my lecture today. What I have done is I have written down the lecture. So I try to read it because on this media, uh, one one doesn't get any feedback immediately. You know, when we give lectures, then what we um, do is we know whether we are understood or we are not understood, whether we have been able to communicate our thought or not. And then we can change accordingly the pitch and the, um, and the content of our lecture. But on this media, I'm afraid uh, it is not possible and that is why I normally don't agree to give uh, lectures, web layer lectures at all. But it was Professor Pati who insisted and I had to agree because I cannot say no to him. Uh, you see, uh, we have just now talked about uh, economist conception of happiness, happiness index biological and botanical uh, aspect of happiness and sociological, you know, the happiest country in the world and all that. But what is happiness? Since a philosopher is primarily concerned with asking 
and answering and attempting to answer uh, questions which are basic and fundamental, which are axiomatic, which are taken for granted by all other branches of knowledge. For example, Professor Pati just told us that you know if you uh, if you take a particular kind of uh, medicine, you become happy. Your brain gets exhilarated, and you try to be a part of happiness. But what is happiness? What does happiness consist in? That is a question that I am going to address in my paper. So I I, I try to read it. Uh, I don't know how to get feedback, like whether I'm communicative or not. But at the end of it, of course, I'll be ready to answer any questions that you have. So my purpose in this paper is to seek an answer to the question, what is happiness and how it can be achieved? How it can be achieved was just now told us by the economist uh, registrar and the biologist vice chancellor that if you take a particular kind of Herb, then you will become happy. But when do I think that I am happy? That is the question. What happens? What happens to my material and spiritual conditions, which will make me happy? But when will I say that I am happy? Supposing I drink a lot, and I become very happy, or I, I take marijuana and all these things, and I become happy. But what is it? That will make me say that I am happy right now. What are the content of it? That is what the philosophical question is. For example, an economist like you, sir, would be saying that if the growth rate is so high, the consumption pattern is low, and you are able to get what you want, then apparently you are a happy person. These are statistical figures. Are the stati do the statistical figures ensure? that I am happy. And what is a happy state? Is it a state or not? That is the question that we will be dealing with in this paper. This question has been asked from times immemorial by the literators, philosophers, and psychologists, and now, of course, sociologists, and I'm told just now botanists too. They have continuously pondered over the nature and type of happiness and the techniques of achieving permanent happiness. The reason for this is that human beings, right from their origin, wants to be to lead a happy life. He wants to get rid of all the physical and psychological suffering, and of course economic sufferings too, and strive for it relentlessly. But suffering does not leave him. It, it always surrounds us. You know, however much I may try to escape from suffering, pain, displeasure, but I'm always surrounded by it. I may get happiness for a moment, but then again, that I may lose this happiness, may all the thought that I may lose this happiness and increases my suffering or pain. So, uh, so suffering does not leave me. Suffering is a permanent state in which I live. It is a bitter truth of our life that pain and suffering surrounds us from the very beginning of our life, from the birth to the time of inevitable death. According to Aristotle, uh, to say that happiness is the supreme good seems a platitude. Despite this, it remains a fact, as the Lai Lama says, the most fundamental aspirations of all human beings is to seek happiness, to overcome suffering. That is what we all want to do. Even when we are sitting here, attending this uh, lecture, we are still wanting to get happiness. We want to get rid of our suffering. We want to get rid of a permanent state. At least for temporarily, we will get happiness. At least that is what uh, I think right now, that I am making you happy by giving this lecture. They constantly and continuously strive to get rid of this mental and physical, of his mental and physical spins. Nevertheless, it remains the truth of our life that despite all our sincere efforts, prayers and strivings, 
the suffering surrounds us from the time of our birth. That is what Buddha in these four noble truths said, Sarvam Dukkham. The first noble truth is Sarvam Dukkham. All is suffering. In the second, third and fourth noble truths, where uh, he explicates the causes of suffering, the cessation of suffering and the path leading to the cessation of suffering. So just as Aristotle was concerned about get, about the ways of getting happiness, Buddha was also concerned about the ways of getting happiness. Not only that, uh, even Bhagavad Gita says that, uh, says in 2.65 that a serene or a happy life removes all our pains and sufferings. However, this question, what is happiness, is an enigma. It is like the question, what is time? Since Augustine, in his book Confessions, discussing about the expressibility of the nature of time, says, what is time? If, I, if no one asks me, I know. When I'm saying, what is time? I'm not saying, what is the time right now? I'm saying, what is the notion of time? Just as I'm concerned, with the question, what is the notion of happiness? What is the concept of happiness? When somebody asks me, what is the notion of time? What is the concept of time? Uh, I, I know I'm not able to answer that question. If no one asks me, I know. We all know what is time. But when I'm asked to explain, I'm at a loss as I'm not able to provide an answer. So. To the question, what is time, I'm not able to answer at all. The notion of happiness is like the notion of time. We know what happiness is, but when asked to explain, we are bewildered as we are not able to provide a, a cogent answer. As Wittgenstein put it, it is something that we know when no one asks us, but no longer know when we are supposed to give an account of it. So time. We know what is time. We know we all know, but when we are give, we are asked to give an account of it, when we are uh, asked to explain it, then we are not able to answer at all. We find no answer. However, thought though we are able to describe happiness positively, like Arthur Schopenhauer, we can say all happiness and gratification is that which is negative, the mere abolition of a desire and extinction of pain. This definition has the merit of explaining the fact that as a rule, we find pleasure much less pleasurable, pain much more painful than what we expect. In one, time does not pass. And in the other, it takes wings. When we are happy, well, we don't know when the days passed. But when we are sad, they never come to an end. We are always thinking of those sufferings or pains. So if we define happiness as a gratification, then at least one thing we know that happiness is what we seek. It does not last for a long time. Or when we are happy or when we are in a happy state of mind, then the time flies. And when we are in a sad state of mind, the time does not fly. That is the experience of all of us. According to Aristotle, happiness is not a state. Since if it were, it might belong even to a man who slept throughout his life, passing a vegetable existence, or to a victim of the greatest misfortunes. Happiness belongs to an activity. So happiness is not a state. Happiness is an activity. Happiness belongs to an activity. Buddha categorically, categorically states, and uh, Mr. Um, Mr. Um, Registrar, you had already pointed out, happiness is not something ready-made. I mean, this we have to keep in mind. <coughs> Since happiness is not a state, happiness is not something ready-made. It comes from your own actions. We have to act in order to be happy. He goes on to say, happiness is not the absence of problems. It is the ability to deal with them. So happiness 
we get happiness we are able when we are able to sort solve or sort out a problem and therefore it is an activity according to Bhag bhagavad puran happiness can be classified into four categories uh, the four categories are tamasic happiness this is the pleasure derived from narcotics mr vice chancellor sir please notice this is the pleasure derived from narcotics alcohol cigarettes meat products violence sleep etc the thing that the happiness that you were talking about the induced happiness that you were talking about when we take a drug is the this kind of happiness it is a tamasic happiness then there is rajasic happiness this is the pleasure from the gratification of the five senses and the mind. Sattvic happiness, then there is the third is Sattvic happiness. This is the pleasure experienced through practicing virtues such as compassion, karma, service to others, cultivation of knowledge, stealing of the mind, etc. It includes the bliss of self realization experienced by jnanis when they stabilize the mind upon the soul finally there is nirgun happiness this is the divine bliss of god which is infinite in extent shri krishna explains that the yogi who becomes free from material contamination and becomes united with god attains this highest state of perfect happiness he has called this unlimited bliss in verse 5.2 and supreme bliss in uh, verse 6.221 of the Bhagavad Gita. So we have these four kinds of happiness and our ultimate goal should be the fourth kind of happiness. However, to all, the, all, all of us who uh, belong to the materialist world, even sattvic happiness would be uh, a good goal to aim at. Buddha categorically says happiness is not a, not pleasant amusements. Again, he's going back to sattvic happiness. Happiness is an end in itself. It is not a means of some end. Since the days of Aristotle, happiness was thought to have at least two aspects. Hedonia, to which uh, Moin referred to in his uh, introductory speech. Hedonia, that is, Hedonia is pleasure. It is not exactly pleasure, but it can be roughly tra translated to pleasure, sukh in Hindi, and eudaimonia, a life well lived. Eudaimonia means that you live a life, you are contented with your life. In contemporary psychology, happiness is referred to, this is the third dimension that has been added to this, referred to as simply pleasure and meaning. Positive psychologists such as Dr. Telegram have recently added one more distinct component to the definition of happiness, that is engagement. We must be active, we must be involved in things. Engagement refers to living a good life of conducive work, loving family, caring friends, and choices, constructive hobbies. That is to say, we live with what we have come to call people with the positive thinking, the people whom we like, the activities which are our hobby. The fact that man has to strive and make a conscious effort to achieve happiness further strengthens the thesis that happiness is not a state. As Schopenhauer says again, the life of the great majority is only a constant struggle for the same existence with the certainty of with the certainty of losing it i know that happy state will go but still i must strive for it what enables them to uh, endure this very very some battle is not so much the love of life as the fear of death which nevertheless stands in the background as inevitable and which may come on the scene any moment this is what Schopenhauer says, but then this is a Western perspective. I think Indian perspective that is not in the background at all. So one can say that happiness is being alive. It is not a passive state. 
according to Aristotle, happiness does not consist in occupations, but in activities in accordance with virtue. This is very important. The activities have to be in accordance with the virtue. Sadguna, what is called sadguna, we have to be, uh, we have to follow the moral principles in all our actions. Any action which does not have a moral principle, a moral law, is not ethical, is not at all a, uh, will not at all lead us to happiness. Happiness is distinct from pleasure. I mean, now we must make a distinction between happiness and pleasure. Uh, Professor Pati, when he talked about various kinds of mental states induced by uh, by some herbs, uh, he was talking about pleasure. He was not talking about happiness. Happiness is distinct from pleasure. A pleasure can be abandoned after it is achieved. So this is very important dis distinction. Once you achieve a pleasure, then you can abandon it. I'll give, give an example to illustrate that. Pleasure can be achieved and therefore has an end. Once you achieve your pleasure, it is an end. It is satisfaction. It is satisfaction. It's, sat it's satisfaction marks the end of the quest for it. Happiness has no end. It is a perennial thing. It goes on. It is a project. This is the difference. It is a project which is, uh, those of us who know Sartre, they will know that life is a project. It is going beyond where we are. We have to take that project and project is never ending project. So happiness is a never ending project. Happiness never surrenders to its fulfillment. It is a continuous never ending process of purging desires and extermination of pain and suffering. It is as Leibniz argues, a perpetual progress to new pleasures and new perfections. I achieve a perfection, then I go further. And you, 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 we all begin as lecturers, then we aspire to become readers, then we aspire to become professor, then maybe vice chancellor and governor or whatever. But the project goes on. Project never stops. If the project stops, our life stops. So our, our life is an unending project. In fulfilling the project, in fulfilling the steps in the project, we get happiness. Uh, this can be illustrated by children's behavior. We have all children and we know how, how they behave. They enjoy their, first they say, I want a Barbie doll. I want this toy. I want this cycle. They want toys. They enjoy their toys or food or whatever and when so they desire all these things but whenever whatever, and when the pleasure from them is over they are bored with them and start their search for new toys etc which will enhance their pleasure so when the, when they achieve their pleasure from the toy they are abandoned they are left you, all of us have, uh, I'm sure, trunk full of toys in our houses, which we brought for our children. But then, uh, once that, then this toy, this Barbie doll, has no meaning at all. Once the child overgrows that, the eating of the hamburger that the child insists, or the pizza that the child insists, is over. Can he never eat a pizza or a hamburger? So happiness is something which everyone desires. Happiness is not a supreme value. As Bentham, Mill and other utilitarians, utilitarians and pragmatists thought. Or as Charvakas in the Indian context argued. The following thought experiment shows that happiness is not something that we wish to achieve at any cost. You see, we want to have happiness. We all want to have our happiness. We all want to be happy. But do we want to be happy at all costs? That is the question. If we are not, then apparently happiness is not a state of mind. Suppose, now I'm, I'm taking the hypothetical uh, case. 
Suppose we have, a, we have access to an existing or soon to be invented drug, which will induce us, induce in us extreme, infinite and perpetual happiness. As uh, Professor Pati was telling us, there may be some kind of a drug that we eat and we are, we are perpetually happy. But as a side effect of this drug that Professor Pati may invent someday, or which is already there, uh, but as a side effect, render us infertile so that there is no future progeny, making our generation the last generation of human beings. Please ask yourself whether you would like such a situation that we become the last happy members of the human race. And then after us, there is no race at all. Shall we choose that kind of a drug? I'm sure that most of us will not like to eat that drug as we value continuity of human race above our individual or collective happiness. Because continuity of life has an intrinsic value higher than the other value. Thus, happiness alone cannot be an end uh, of human conduct. So we don't really work only for happiness. We also work for happiness as well as other things. If the other things have more important ethical value, then we would like to proceed there and be even unhappy. You know, all of us, I'm uh, just reminded now, all of us are, uh, for example, uh, we went through various difficulties in our life. We had to study very hard, whereas the other boys uh, were enjoying themselves. But why did we do that? We did that because our future should be happy. So we, we undergo suffering for a considerable period of time. And then finally, we arrive at, uh, arrive at a situation. We prefer to undergo this hardship for a later happiness that we later and more permanent happiness that we may have. Uh, this point is also uh, illustrated by Plato. In Plato's dialogue Gorgias, Callisclus argues for the, for the conventional general belief that happiness lies in not representing, uh, not repressing one's desires, want, appetite, and passions. On the contrary, it lies in making one's appetites as strong as possible and satisfying them with courage and intelligence at all costs. We are undergoing the, the process of this lecture because we want to learn something which will be more permanent. On this view, happiness consists in increasing one's desires, wants and making all efforts to achieve what is desired it is a process of never ending willing and continuous ac accomplishments. An identical view is upheld by Charvakas when they argue that the enjoyment of heaven lies in eating delicious food, keeping company. This is the view which Calculus also takes in Gorgias. The enjoyment of heaven lies in eating del delicious food, keeping company of young women, using fine clothes perfumes, garlands, sandal paste, etc. While moksha is death, which is cessation of life death. The wise, therefore, ought not to take things on account of moksha. According to them, only a fool tries to wear himself out by penances and fasts, chastity and other such ordinances laid down by clever weaklings. So, there is nothing wrong in having desires, but those desires must yield a more permanent uh, seat than we have. For example, we have all studied so long, we have studied hard, people were playing, but we were spending our midnight, we were burning our proverbial midnight oil just to get into the state where we are to. And we prefer this than those things. So, Calicles and 
and uh, and uh, charvakas are wrong in my mind in thinking that we should only think of the immediate pleasures i'll come back to this uh, at the end of the lecture so after this argues against calculus thesis and upholds that happiness does not lie in enjoyment of whatever kind without qualification without making a distinction between good and bad pleasures we have to make a distinction between good and bad pleasure we have to make uh, uh, ma make a distinction between temporary ephemeral happiness to the constant permanent happiness Socrates argues that happiness consists in being moderate this is very important and in control of oneself and master of one's own passions and appetites if i if the appetite stays me carry me and i have no control over them then those appetites are not good they are, they cannot lead me to happiness so one criterion of happiness is that it doesn't carry you you carry them you and life them according to him intemperate craving can never be satisfied temperate life is one in which one is content with whatever comes to hand and asks for no more the temperate are happier and than the intemperate this view uh, comes very close to the doctrine of madhya marga of buddha the middle path uh, isha upanishad too teaches us that happiness lies in pain pain buddhita enjoyment in renunciation enjoyment is not in consumption but in renunciation renunciation doesn't mean going to jungle or something but renunciation of the goods or pleasurable goods and sharing it and not leaving it all together but sharing it with the rest of the people rest of the people around us mahatma gandhi Uh, interpreting the above conclusion, that above, I mean this pain, 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 bhunjita concludes, man's happiness really lies in contentment. He who is discontented, however much he possesses, becomes a slave to his desires, and really there is no slavery equal to that of his desires. So if I am a slave to my desire, then apparently I cannot be happy. It can can any slave be happy? That is the question. All the, why do we care for freedom? This also I am going to take up further. I, all the sages have declared from the house tops that man can be his own worst enemy as well as his best friend. To be free or to be slave lies in his own hands. And what is true for the individual is true for the society also. So Gandhi is also insisting that we we should carry the Uh, carry the things which give us pleasure, not that we should be swayed by those things which uh, which which give us immediate pleasure. Desires are not extinguished by attaining the desired object. Fulfillment of a desire only flames further desires. Desires are smoothed by canton by contentment with what we have after achieving all his material goods and fulfilling all his desires. Yayati, in the Yayati Vachanam, arrives at the conclusion that our desires are not. I, I, I have a Sanskrit quote here, but I don't think that is required. Its meaning is our desires are not quieted by fulfilling them; rather, they are inflamed by their fulfillment. Their fulfillment acts like the ghee uh, does in inflate in inflaming the fire further. The desires can come to an end only when we are content. With what we have, so contentment uh, is an important factor in giving us happiness. Being satisfied with what we have extinguishes all our desires. As an old adage says, happiness is not having what you want; it is appreciating what you have. So, what you we should not do. If we keep on searching, then we will be, that will be like. the two rails two parallel rails where 
we are trying to go to the point where the two parallel uh, rails meet or where the horizon is supposing i give you uh, i say that i'll give you a pot of gold provided you reach the horizon now can what is wrong with this uh, uh, argument that i am giving just now can you reach the supposing somebody says oh well there is a pot of gold let me go let me run he has fallen into the trap so we should not uh, we should know what desires are to be can be fulfilled and what desires cannot be fulfilled so happiness is not having what you want it is appreciating what you have so whatever i have if i try to appreciate it if i feel contented with it then happiness will be a natural outcome of it aristotle argues that happiness does not consist in enjoying the material goods either in extremes or in moderation or in their voluntary renunciation rather lies in contemplation see how how much greek uh, philosophers and the indian philosophers too uh, they laid emphasis on contemplation what we have we should think about it according to him only those who engage in the activity of contemplation are happy he argues that the more people contemplate the happier they are not incidentally but in virtue of their contemplation because it is in itself in itself precious contemplation thinking about things living those thoughts is what will make us happy buddha says the same thing when he says the happiness of your life depends upon the quality of your thought whereas for all other practical mental or physical activities required the participation of other fellow beings contemplation is self sufficient in the sense that we don't need the presence of the outsider or the other uh, those of us who have read sartre read sartre we know sartre says the other is hell the other is hell because he is a limitation on my freedom i don't feel free when the other is present so buddha is also saying the same thing when he says physical all physical activities all activities actually by physical all activities other than spiritual activities they require the participation of the other i have to get more wealth than you i have to go farther than you i have to run at a faster speed than you i have to have more wealth than you this is the other is hell so the in all worldly things i have to have the other but in contemplation i don't need the other i am self sufficient i can think contemplate on my own i don't need anybody else i can think of my experiences i can think of even others but others as objects of contemplation and not objects of competition aristotle again argues that contemplation is both the highest form of activity since the intellect is the highest thing in us and the objects that it apprehends are the highest things that we can know and also it is most continuous because we are more capable of continuous contemplation than we are of any practical activity i cannot keep learning i cannot keep on delivering this lecture you cannot keep on hearing this lecture and so contemplation is something which you can keep on doing even when you go for a morning walk you can contemplate even when you are uh, sitting in this lecture you can contemplate even when i am giving uh, this lecture delivering this lecture i i can contemplate so contemplation by its very nature is the most continuous activity that we can indulge in practical activities are neither complete nor perfect contemplation is a complete and perfect activity therefore it leads to happiness as nothing that pertains to happiness is incomplete or imperfect if anything is imperfect 
then it cannot lead you to happiness because you want to keep on making it more perfect. Now the computers, the speed of computers, we are, we want to increase them and we want to make them even Why? the moment I press a button, it must uh, come to the point where I left last time. In Bhagavad Gita 2.64, Krishna says for being happy, we have to do what? We have to perceive objects with the organs that are free from attraction and repulsion and are under their under his own control, the self-controlled person alone attains serenity and that is happiness. So if you are controlled by desires of material objects, then apparently you cannot be, you can never be happy because one desire will lead you to another desire, as I have said earlier also. In other words, a person who has a complete control on himself though lives in this world, but he is neither attracted nor detached by the objects surrounding him. Living thus in the world, he has no attraction for them. None of the objects of the universe finds a place in the wish list, in, in his wish list. He has no attraction for them, nor he is jealous of the persons who, are, who possess them. He has no attachment with either the physical or the mental objects. So a person like this Sith Pragya alone is happy. Attachment is the sole cause of our desire to enjoy the objects of the world. These desires are the root cause of our unhappiness and discontentment. Possession of these objects by others and our being devoid of them gives rise to jealousy and dissatisfaction, which in turn give rise to anger or suffering. Buddha, too, in his second noble truth, applying the theory of Pratitya Samutpad, arrives, uh, arrives uh, at the conclusion that Krishna, desire, is the root cause of all pain and suffering. Desires born out of Krishna are the fundamental causes of suffering. Therefore, in order to lead a life of happiness, we must endeavor to kill our Krishna. In Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita 2.66, uh, Krishna arrives at the same conclusion when he says, that is, uh, when he says, for the unsteady there is no wisdom and there is no meditation for the unsteady man. And for the unmeditative man, there is no peace. How can there be happiness for one without peace? So, in order to be happy, we have to be at peace with ourselves. And in order to be at peace with ourselves, we have to control, if not annihilate, our desires. A person who loses control on his senses keeps moving aimlessly from one object to the other, like rudderless ship. An aimless person cannot be happy. In Bhagavad Gita, again in Bhagavad Gita 6.27, Krishna explains thus, Supreme bliss comes to the, to the yogi alone, whose mind has become perfectly tranquil, whose quality of rajas has been eliminated, who has become identified with Brahman. Aristotle argues, since the true self of the individual is the authoritative and best part of him, so it would be an odd, it would be odd, uh, it would be an odd thing of if a man chooses, uh, choose to live someone else's life instead of his own. That is, if I do not follow my life and I want to be, to follow your life, then apparently I cannot be a happy man. But desires make me do so. So happiness consists in living an authentic life akin to one's true self or somehow the potential the arch, the ability and the limit that we naturally inherit in a person and swadharma, the intrinsic nature or what basically constitutes the uniqueness of personality. So whatever we are, we must live that life. Whatever is our dharma, whatever is our duty, we must follow. My station, if uh, F.H. Bradley said long ago, my station and my duties. So this is my, whatever station I have, I must perform its, the corresponding duties 
uh, to the best of my abilities. Imitating someone else's lifestyle or to follow his ideals or his mindset increases our unhappiness. We should not live a life inspired by an ideal by an ideal exemplified in someone else's life. The ideal pursued by him may be appropriate to his life and circumstances. So we should not say we should when we look at others and we find them very happy and uh, they're following a particular lifestyle, then it may be that for them it is okay. But that doesn't suit my sohav, my nature, my swadharma. So if I try to follow them, then I'll be naturally unhappy. The, uh, the ideals pursued by him may be appropriate to his life and circumstances. Hence, he may be leading a happy life. In his book, Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle explains the distinction between Subhav and Swadharma thus. See, Subhav and Swadharma are innate qualities. They distinguish one person from the other. They distinguish between different virtues. He explains his view by taking the example of an apricot tree and an apple tree. The reason why apples grow on an apple tree and apricots grow on an apricot tree alone and not vice versa is their particular nature or subhav. Can an apple grow on an apricot tree? Because apricot, the nature of apricot is such that it can only uh, yield apricot fruits. Each of these trees is following its own nature. They do not copy one another's nature. If an apple tree would grow apricot, would desire, supposing this is a thought experiment again, if it desires to grow apple uh, apricots, then can it do it? It will only be unhappy that it has chosen a goal which cannot be fulfilled, which is not in accordance to, which is not in conformity with its own nature. So we have, if we want to seek happiness, we must follow our nature. For us to emulate someone else's lifestyle is what Sartre calls living in bad faith. If I try to do what you are doing and are happy, then apparently I'm living in bad faith. The antonym of bad faith is sincerity. Facing up fully to one's predicament as a self-reflective human being, not tied to any essence, social role or moral code. This, according to Sartre, is not sincerity to one's nature or a sense, but it is sincerity in the sense that one transcends one's nature as a being of this or that type. We surpass this being and that not towards another being, but towards emptiness, towards nothing. Living a sincere life makes our life happy. This way to happiness is to do well, whatever, whatever we are, as per our subhav, especially qualified, especially qualified to do so, and free choose and freely choose to do so. Because no limit to my freedom can be found except freedom itself. Freedom is an end in itself. Or if you prefer, we are not free to cease being free. That is why we not to be free is also a freedom. So if we go deep into the notion of freedom, we find that we have to be, we have to, we will be happy doing only those things which we, which uh, emanate from our freedom. Happiness lies in enjoying freedom of choice, which is our true essence. So that is our true essence. Our sodharma is our subhav is that to be to be free and choose freely. Happiness means being free to make our choices. Choices. Mahatma Gandhi agrees with Sartre when he says, "Happiness means." an enlightened realization of human dignity and a craving for human liberty, which prizes itself above mere selfish satisfaction of personal comforts and material wants and would readily and joyfully sacrifice these
for self-preservation. This is what Mahatma Gandhi says. And see how close he comes to Martha. Once we attain happiness, we have to share it with others. Our happiness is not something private. It is not to be kept in lock and key. By doing so, we only multiply our happiness. When we share our happiness, we multiply our happiness. As Buddha says, thousands of candles can be lit from a single candle and the life of the candle will not be shortened. Happiness never decreases by being shared. This can be explained by giving, uh, by going through the following narrative. A crow lived in, I, I'm, I'm giving a, uh, giving a uh, narrative. A crow lived a very sad, wretched and unhappy life. He used to think like all of us do. He used to think that he was neither handsome nor had a good and attractive voice. He thought that a cuckoo must be living a very happy life, happy and satisfied life, because she has a very sweet wine. He went to the cuckoo and asked her whether she was happy. The cuckoo so told him that she was not leading a happy life because her dark black color, because of her dark black color. She further said that a flamingo must be happier than her because her dark uh, be, uh, must be happier than her because along with a sweet voice, he possesses, a, possesses an attractive color also. The crow went to the, the crow flew to the flamingo to find out if he was leading a happy life. The flamingo replied in the negative and attributed the reason of his unhappiness to, the, to his single color. He said, look, I have only one color, so I'm not happy. Uh, he said to the crow that a parrot must be a happier creature because in addition to being sweet tongued, he possesses many colors. Because his sweet tongue and the capacity to converse with human beings, he is very popular among men. When the crow met the parrot and inquired about his happiness, the parrot replied in the negative and said that peacock must be much happier than him because while he possesses only two or three colors, the parrot has many colors and many shades of them. He has very good bodily form. Attracted by the variety of his colors, many people take, self, take selfies with him. His dance is also very skillful and attracts many human beings. They wait for several hours to witness him dancing. Hearing this, the crow went to see the peacock. To see the peacock. The peacock said, I am not happy. More than me, a crow must be happy. On hearing this, the crow started wondering, how could that be? He asked the peacock, how can a crow be happy? Why do you say so? Because he was amazed. The peacock replied by saying that he has never seen a crow in an enclosure in any zoo all over the world. He realized that happiness does not lie in color or sweet voice or wealth or in other physical features. Rather, it lies in our being free, in our freedom to do so, do that, in, in our freedom to do what we want. So freedom is what should make us happy. Even Santulsi Das in his Ramcharit Manas says, para, para A person who is under the control of somebody else who has no freedom cannot uh, be happy, uh, cannot be imagined to be happy. On achieving our happiness, we have to share it with others, as I've said earlier. By doing so, we increase our happiness manifold. Buddha says, without diminishing the brightness of a lighted candle, we can light many candles. Likewise, happiness is not reduced by sharing it. One has to remember that happiness is not a station you arrive at, but a manner of traveling. So one has to, cons to consciously respond to, uh, to consciously espouse a way of life 
which as Plato asserts in the Laws, uh, that life must be lived as a play. See, this is what Plato says in Laws. Life must be lived as a play. Play means here, Leela. Uh, lived as a play, playing certain games, making sacrifices, singing and dancing, and then a man will be able to propitiate the gods and defend himself against his enemies and win in the contest. So only when we look at life as a play, as a leader, that we are able to conquer everything around us. By accepting the lived life as a Leela play, one lives a happy and contented life. It is a perennial quest and search for that which will make us feel contented. What makes us content, various, uh, content, content varies uh, from context to context, from time to time, from one form of life to another form of life. So it is the form of life, the context, which will determine what gives us happiness at any given point of time. So does the notion of happiness. We have to remember morals drawn from the cockroach theory by Sundar Pichai. Namely that, Sundar Pichai gave a speech in Madras uh, about uh, five years ago, and in which he said, and I'm quoting him, person who is happy is not because everything is right in his life. We should never think that a happy person in, in that the life of a happy person is happy because he has no problems, no issues. Everything is right in his life. He is happy because the attitude towards everything in his life is right. So it is in our attitude that uh, attitude towards the problems, to the problems that we face, that makes us happy or unhappy. The Lai Lama, incidentally, to um, uh, to endorsing this view, says that for happiness, and I'm quoting, it is important to cultivate an attitude to maintain hope. Another dimension is introduced. That when we are unhappy, when we are suffering, uh, then hope creates a kind of uh, kind of uh, uh, kind of way. It leads a way to our happiness. Important to cultivate an attitude to maintain hope. Hope can make a great difference to how you respond to problems, in difficult, problems and difficulties. We must remember that happiness is always a choice. This we should never forget. That happiness is always a choice. That we have to hope for happiness. You cannot wait for a circumstance to be better. So again, we have to be active. We remember I have talked about activity. You cannot wait for happy situations to come. No, we have to work for them. We have to strive for them. You have to create your own good fortune. It is not given. We have to create it. We have all worked. So we create it. We have to look for ways to be happy every day. It is a constant struggle, a perpetual struggle that we, in order, if we want to be happy, then we will have to create circumstances. If we, are, we never have to uh, get rid of the hope, the inherent hope that we have. Incidentally, Albert Einstein, during his visit to Japan in 1922, in place of the, uh, in, uh, Japan in 1922, I must say, in Japan he received the news that he has got the Nobel Prize. So when uh, the, the news was brought to him by a waiter, the waiter brought a slip saying that uh, a telegram saying that he has been awarded a Nobel Prize, and uh, Einstein did not have uh, did not have any money to pay him as a tip. So he wrote on a slip of paper, and what he wrote was, "Calm and modest life brings more happiness than the constant pursuit of success, combined with constant relentlessness." And this uh, note, of course, as we know, uh, got uh, thousands, um, millions of dollars it was sold. A happy person is happy not because everything is right in his life. He is happy because his attitude, his attitude towards everything in his life is right. Pain is inevitable. We must remember this. 
as I told in the beginning also, pain and suffering are the constant state in which we are. Pain is inevitable. It is an inevitable part of our life. It is a necessary accompaniment of life. When we are born, we are born in pain. When we die, we die in pain. But suffering, it depends. Pain is one thing and suffering is another thing. Pain is a state. Pain is the situation in which we are. Painful situation can be there. But then painful, but suffering, which is which which is which originates from pain, but suffering, it depends upon how we take it. Then pain we all face. But how we confront pain, how we deal with our pain is what makes us happy or unhappy. So suffering, whether we consider it suffering or happiness, that will depend upon our attitude. Depends uh, on how we, in our attitude towards it, so suffering is optional. Pain is not optional, but suffering is optional because it is our attitude towards it which will make it suffering or happiness. We can have pain which is a natural process but do not suffer it because suffering is a mental artificially created construct. So suffering is a natural byproduct of our attitude. If we have to a positive attitude we will not suffer and be happy. Even when we have a severe pain, an equanimous attitude towards pain and pleasure, gain and loss will make a strict an equanimous mind. In Sophia Lawrence's words, again I am taking an example from, from the films, always be happy. She says, always be happy in her autobiography. She loved it. Always be happy. Often when we lose hope and think this is the end, we should have the hope that God smiles from above and says, relax, sweetheart. It is just a bend, not an end. If we have this attitude towards pain and suffering, the pain uh, that we get, then apparently that it is not the end. It is only, a, it, it's not, it's only a bend and not an end. We must engage ourselves in activities for happiness. We must engage ourselves in activities which have long-term tangible results. That is the distinction between activities that we involve in. As the old proverb goes, short-lived pleasures is the parent of pain. What gives pain, what gives us suffering is the short-lived, our hankering after short-lived pleasures. Even if happiness lasts for a short spell and is ephemeral, it does not lose its value. Just as thought and love do not lose their value because they are not everlasting. As Russell says, in uh, what I believe, happiness is not true happiness because it must come to an end. We must not forget any Gillard's observation, how we spend our days. We should not hanker after making our life happy. Our life is a general concept. How we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. So lives are, lives constitute of the days that we live. And so we must not hanker after the whole, but we must try to make our days happy by arousing in us the hope and performing activities in arriving at them. We should try to make the individual days of our life happy. Our life will automatically be happy one. Let me conclude, thankfully, uh, with Dalai Lama saying, the key to happiness has nothing to do with beliefs belief in God, heaven or spirituality. It has to be contentment and affection within oneself. So we have to look within. We, we will find our happiness by looking within our contentment 
by living within and satisfaction also by living within thank you very much for this for bearing with me thanks a lot i have taken a lot of time actually i should have finished it earlier yeah thank you thank you so much for, uh, sir for the nice lecture uh, now i request uh, uh, professor mohin mamma sir the head of the department of philosophy uh, to conduct the question and answer session on uh, more than 2025 questions were received uh, but sir will uh, manage it manage it within my 10 15 minutes time sir sir uh, so it is a question um which eudomonia or order and eudomonia and happiness are incompatible when order regulates and controls our mind and body in the name of collective happiness individual freedom is a casualty therefore a maximalist state is not conducive for well being and happiness your response sir you see uh, normally when we talk about first of all let me take the last question first well being well being is more or less uh, a concept which deals with material well being so we can uh, have material well being but again there also i uh, should should the poverty line in india be the same as poverty line in uh, us this question will always remain because we have to be uh, the notion of well being will also shift or change from context to context from life to life from nation to nation so the concept of well being is also a shifting uh, notion so happiness is uh, not a shifting notion we can say that people should be happy everywhere whereas for well being material especially material well being we will have to uh, we will have to work out uh, the context in which one is talking about it so uh, our, that is why we cannot have a happiness index the economists here they would say that happiness is not uh, how can there be an economic a universal global uh, happiness index cannot be there because they are taking into account that the economists are only taking into account the well being factor so they are not taking into account what is called happiness factor so this is one point and the second is collective happiness. yes of course happiness is an individual person number one it's an individual quality then we have collective happiness if a society wants to be happy what should it do it should try to remain within its means within what it has if it does that it will be a happy society so if a society looks within and is not in competition with the other nations or other societies then apparently it will be a happy society or okay sir thank you sir that is another question from the kansuna Happiness is not a state, but an activity. As you have told, yes. if it is true, then question arises that activity of whom? If it, if it is our activities, yes, definitely. All activities of us not provide happiness. If activities of others, then then why activities of others hurt us, not provide happiness? Uh, sure i do make a distinction between happiness as a state and happiness as an activity if happiness was a state then it should be predetermined for everyone but it is not so so it is not a state number one so of course it is a human activity it is an individual activity individual activity which takes into account those actions which are not ephemeral but have a long lasting uh, effect on us for example uh, look at a child supposing the child uh, does not work doesn't do hard, do hard work doesn't take interest in the education that he is getting at that point of time then up, and he wants to play all the time 
then apparently that activity will not lead to happiness. Activity which aims at permanent ends, which aims at enduring, I should not say permanent, but enduring ends. So if an activity leads to an enduring act, then it will be a happy activity. It will be activity which will lead to happiness. Thank you, sir. Uh, another question, sir. Uh, it is from uh, the each happiness uh, of others, good to others, will lead to the path of happiness. I mean, if those uh, things are not good, be good be a path to happiness. This is right. okay. Uh, if I understood you right, then what you mean is that if I am bothered about others' happiness along with my own happiness, will that be happiness or not? Is that right? If that is so, then I have already said that if I share a happiness, then apparently my happiness will increase, that person's happiness will also increase. So happiness lies in sharing, uh, sharing the activities which I consider to be happy uh, This is uh, Dr. Sharma. Uh, this is a very important question from our uh, Vice Chancellor, sir. Can it be a trait in some or all individuals? I mean, happiness. Can it be a trait or a trait in all? Happiness mm -hmm. can it be trait in some or all individuals? Same. You yeah. think happiness, yeah. happiness, happiness can can happiness be the same in everyone? No, no. Trait, trait, trait. 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 So say it again, be a character. I mean, character. Can oh. happiness be a great? Be a great. As a trait. Yeah. Okay, okay. Great in some Can happiness be a trait? Yes. Uh, happiness is a trait which we all share. We all, even if we are undergoing the worst phase of our life and we are suffering everything around suffering everything around us, the company, the results, and everything, then also there's a hope for happiness. The hope for happiness is a trait which we all share. So it is not at any stage of time I do not leave this hope. And this uh, perennial perusal of the activities which will lead me to happiness is a path which every one of us wants to follow. I think it is a trait. Thank you. Thank you. So it is uh, one of the questions from uh, K. Narayan Rao. Who is happy? The man who is happy? Who is happy? The man on this stage. Yeah. Having a very deep sleep in spite of noises and disturbances, or a man in a well furnished house with all amenities, feelings, sleeplessness through making all efforts to sleep. Uh, well, between the two, uh, both are happy if they are living according to their nature, if their sohav is such. If a person is able to enjoy, or if a person on the street is able to enjoy, despite all the disturbances around him, a good sleep, then apparently he is happy as far as the sleep is concerned. And if the person having all the luxuries is not able to sleep uh, on the bed of roses, then apparently he is not a happy person. But anyway, this, this question is so difficult to answer. It has to be seen from, uh, from different aspects. I think 
happiness uh, is if 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 a person feels that he is happy if he, if a person inherently feels that he is a happy person then apparently i think we have no right to question his happiness yeah so one good i just said ask the judge this one Sir, I have one doubt. Sometimes we desire to want something, and finally we got this, and feeling very much happy. Here my question is: that type of happiness is called satisfaction or not? Yeah. Well, that is uh, when we, you see, when we uh, have achieved a target, and we are happy, right? And that happiness gives us satisfaction, but with the rider. that the satisfaction is again temporary we we get for example if i become a professor then i want to become the vice chancellor if i have written one book i want to write 10 books so satisfaction when i see a book in print for example my recent book on contemporary uh, relevance of gandhi contemporary relevance of gandhi when it was accepted by rockledge i was so happy that rupleesh uh, new york is publishing it then when i went through the process of publishing and you know reading proofs counter proofs so and so and answering all the uh, copy editors questions i was thinking what what the hell i have got myself into but then when, I, when you see the book happiness comes and with that satisfaction also comes so it is not that happiness and satisfaction are contradictory to one another they are contrary to so if i say uh, both happiness and satisfaction are temporary states they live for some time they are ephemeral they live for some time and then we look for something else that is what uh, i tend to think at this point of time and that is what has been my experience too so just another couple of questions uh, Namjani Rat, she is asking in this contemporary era of competition by maintaining swadha and swadha, many times one has to face the decisions. One has what, to face. What should be the real practical mantra to get the real happiness sir, in the present world? Is it silence or any other thing? Uh, well, if silence gives you happiness, well and good. But if it doesn't, then one has to work. Work for it. One has to work to achieve the goals. Of course, in the present competitive world, uh, when we talk of at the vyavaric level, then so bhav, whatever is according to. Firstly, I must choose the goals which are according to my subhav. If I cannot do it, for example, if I, if if my nature is not such that I can answer those stupid questions of IAS and pass it. then apparently i must do something more uh, more serious so uh, goals uh, have to be in order to be happy one has to choose goals which uh, which are compatible with one's nature and one's one's nature here of means one's competence you see if i if i wish to become the president of india today then i'll be unhappy always i can never be happy because i will never achieve it so one has to do that so but if silence gives you happiness if silence satisfies you then it will give you happiness too so one uh, one question is uh, that plato uh, through the mouth of socrates in apollo says that happiness man in him Who doesn't have time to think of his happiness? How do you uh, see? Is that in your experience? Well, uh, you see, if I keep on thinking only about my happiness, that is, I I think that is what Plato meant there. But if I keep on thinking about happiness and do nothing. to strive for it then apparently i cannot be either happy or unhappy so one has to strive one has to 
do activity to it. I think Plato, I have not, I, I'll have to read the whole context in which he says this, but uh, tentatively I, I will say that it means that one should not think of happiness, but try to achieve happiness. Yeah, that's what I mean. I think your statement that happiness is an activity. Uh, what is happiness? Yes. Uh, Sir, there are a lot of questions. Please. A lot of questions. But now we just want to conclude it. Uh, my uh, last question. That is a request from our uh, Vice Chancellor, sir. So what is the take home message? What is the take home message of this? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't know what is the take off message. The message can only be that we should never leave hope for better things to come. We should never leave hope that we will be happy one day. So I think that that situation of never leaving hope and always acting uh, towards the goal should be the takeoff from this lecture. At least that is the takeoff I take from this lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, now, now I request our control examination, Dr. Hamukuma Nayak, for the formal vote of thanks. Then that will, that will be followed by the original Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as uh, all good things uh, come to an end in life, so is this uh, lecture uh, of this uh, 12 lectures schedule for the afternoon Jubilee celebration of this great, great institution. On behalf of the JM University Summer Board, I take this opportunity to propose the vote of thanks to those who have directly or indirectly contributed to this 12 lecture series of the Palatinum Jubilee of this institution uh, organized by us. At the outset, I thank uh, our chief speaker, Professor Borasa. We are really enlightened with your uh, presence as well as the presentation of the topic of happiness, satisfaction and contentment. All of us are really impressed with your approach to the happiness. We are also thankful to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Atul Kumar Patisar, for his encouragement and support in all the lecture series organized by this institution. Actually, uh, he is the main source of inspiration for all of us in this university in organizing such type of uh, seminars, workshops, lecture series, etc. A special thanks to the organizing committee headed by the coordinator of IPSC and uh, the head of the Department of Philosophy, Professor Moeen Mohammed Sir, and his team, including Dr. Asukumar Talai, the chairman, postgraduate council of this university, Professor Sachitan uh, Mahapatra Sir. Our controller of finance, Dr. Samajal Ajayi sir, all the teaching and non-teaching staffs of this institution for their unflinching support and coordination. Our heartfelt thanks to our students for active participation in this lecture series. With these one words, we move to the end of this today's lecture. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I request all of you kindly stand up for the national anthem. Jaya Gana Mana Adina Yaka Jaya Hai Bharat Bhagya Vidhata Punjab Singh Gujarat Maratha Dravira Vidhara Vanda Vindya Himachal Yamuna Ganda Chala Jala Dhritaranga Tava Shubha Name Jage Tava Shubha Aashish Maage Gahe Tava Jaya Gaha 
ಜನ ಗಣ ಮಂಗಳ ದಾಯಕ ಜಯ ಹೇ ಭಾರತ ಭಾಗ್ಯ ವಿಭಾಗ ಜಯ ಹೇ ಜಯ ಹೇ ಜಯ 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 ಹೇ Thank you everyone. Uh, now I request our Honorable Vice Chancellor Sir to officially announce the closure of this meeting. I am now very much pleased to declare closure of this program. Thank you very much.